when someone's working with a lighting designer for the first time, maybe it's just a showcase, tech is very limited. What are some helpful things that you found to help that process? For me personally, if you as a choreographer come in with ideas, if you already have plans, if you already know, like, I really want this moment to be blue, tell me that straight out, especially when we're in a truncated session it's it's not worth me guessing that and then eventually we fix it to what you want it to be i can i can help push that into the right kind of place for the piece if you just know blue but tell me those things all this to say you know that could be i want it to be blue or i want this to be really dark or i want this to be really shadowy or i want there to be a lot of like flashing right here like or or i want this moment to be scary you know, like any of those things is helpful to me as a lighting designer to help you get what you're looking for in your piece. I have been in situations where we have 22 minutes to tech this piece and somebody comes in and they say, okay, I have 48 lighting cues. And we go, sure, that's less than 30 <laughs> seconds a cue and you're gonna wanna run it at the end. What is your biggest pet peeve when it comes to working with dancers? Welcome everyone to another special episode for the YouTube channel. So today I have a very good friend of mine. He is an incredibly talented and accomplished lighting designer. Uh, and we actually just worked together at the Orange Grove Intensive and we meant to do this there in person, but things were just so crazy there. We didn't get to do that. So now we're doing it via Zoom. Um, but he, let's see. He has designed for shows that I've been in. I think, I can't believe, I can't remember if we've collaborated on shows as designers, but he's done musicals, he's done dance shows, he's done a lot of cool stuff. So I was super excited. And then he also does a lot of like crazy builds. So very excited to welcome my friend, Peter. Hello, what's up? Hello, how's it going? <laughs> so you are currently based in New York City. But you mm -hmm. actually don't spend a lot of your time in New York. You're traveling a lot for work. I'm here uh, for a week right now, which is really rare. Yeah. <laughs> so I definitely want to get to how you got into this world of lighting design and all that stuff. But I thought just to kick things off right away, I think there are a lot of people, whether they're choreographers or maybe even like studio owners who have to then work with someone for like a recital situation. But a lot of times you're working with a lighting designer like first time you don't have the like six months to a year to really create like a fully fleshed out idea plus like tech is very limited maybe it's just a showcase things like that so when someone's working with a lighting designer for the first time what are some helpful things that you found to help that process be as smooth and clear as possible sure uh so for me personally, if you if you as a choreographer come in with ideas, if you already have plans, if you already know, like, I really want this moment to be blue, tell me that straight out. It is not worth, especially when we're in a truncated session, uh, it's, it's not worth me guessing that. And then eventually we fix it to what you want it to be. Um, and if you say it's blue, then, you know, there are. 16 million colors I can make in a in in an LED fixture right now. Right. So. I can I can help push that into the right kind of place for the piece if you just know blue. But let's but tell me those things and don't pretend that especially in like a festival where we have 45 minutes to make your whole piece and it's a 10 minute piece or whatever, right? Uh we just don't have the time to experiment very much and we should find the ways to be able to experiment within that uh quickly <laughs> and know know where we where you might want to be able to play and you're like i want this to feel really impactful and all this to say you know that could be i want it to be blue or i want this to be really dark or i want this to be really shadowy or i want there to be a lot of like flashing right here like or or i want this moment to be scary you know like any of those things is helpful to me as a lighting designer to help you get what you're looking for in your piece um i have been in situations where we have 22 minutes to tech this piece and somebody comes in and they say, okay, I have 48 lighting cues and we go, sure. That's less than 30 <laughs> seconds of cue and you're going to want to run it at the end. Yeah. So I'll give it a shot. And I, I will always personally, I will always put my all into giving you as close to what you want as I can. But if we get to five minutes before like the rec we have to run it, we're going to start making some choices. We might copy some cues around. There might be ways to solve it, but you know, I, 
I appreciate when choreographers have an understanding of what our timeline is actually like. And I don't need you to know the exact number of cues that I personally can make for you. Right. But, but a sense of if we have 10 minutes, maybe we're not doing 50 cues and maybe we can do more than one, but like, what's, what's, what's a range, right? So, okay. That's, I feel like that leads really well into the next question I was thinking of as you were saying that. So obviously it depends on how, um, intricate the queue is and maybe the skills of the programmers you have working with you but sure. ballpark what's a good like if i'm a choreographer going in and i know we only have 10 minutes to tech what is a realistic ballpark number of cues to have like walking into this process sure uh it's just to specify our timeline right are we saying 10 minutes and then we run it or 10 minutes including a run uh, let's say we have, okay, I'll be, let's say we have 20 minutes total Great. to like tech and run. You have a 20 minute block before the next quarter has to come in and we kick you out of the suit, the room. Sure. Uh, okay. So in that case, I would say you're probably looking at 10 to 20 cues, five to five to 20 cues, depending on like you all, you said the programmer that I'm working with the, you know, and, and how involved you want to be mm -hmm. because there are also choreographers who come in and go, I don't know. <laughs> and that's great. And like, right. we can do that. I, but then I need to see the piece to be able to, uh, work on something with you. So yeah, if we have 20 minutes, we, it's a five minute piece. We want to run at the end, I roughly call it maybe a queue a minute. And okay. that is going to be too much for some people and easy for some other people, but that is probably a pretty safe, safe place to be knowing that you have to run it. And there's going to be some questions from right. like, some conversation between the line designer and the, the stage manager to make sure that, that those cues can be called correctly in the amount of time that we have. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that's a, a reasonable place to be in a festival setting like that. And don't quote me on that, but that is that <laughs> for me, I would, I would think that that's, that's totally doable. Okay. Yeah. Watch someone's going to book you or end up working with you. You're like, but I saw you on YouTube and you said <laughs> <laughs> you could do a cue every minute, <laughs> but now you're asking for this cue that has all the effects in it. Yeah. 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 Does, does that amount of time change if there is projection design also involved in the piece? I would say yes. I mean, it depends on. There have been times when I do both the lights and projection for a piece. Uh, if if there is projection in a piece, either I, as as a sometime projection designer, I would say either you need to have communicated those ideas to the projection designer ahead of time, knowing that that person might be only being paid for those five hours that they're in the space. So that might not mean anything to them. But, you know, to either you have content prepared and we're just putting it up into the space and queuing it correctly or you're giving me some time and the festival is giving me some time to get that content, create that content so that we walk in with something that is, is real mm. because there's not depending on the projection designer, there's not a lot of time to create content like that. And sometimes, you know, we, I can come in with a bunch of stock footage or a stock content and we can make something quickly. But if you're looking for something specific out of that projection design, having uh, a plan, a, a, a pre-discussion or something like that is really helpful. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I feel like it's always such a hard balance. Honestly, just balancing the light coming from stage lights and then the projection surface and the source. And I right. don't know, I feel like people forget that how much, how bright stage lights are and how yeah, dark right. you need to be for projections to really work well. Yeah. Um, and how bright you want to be able to see the dancers. Yeah. In in contrast to that, you know, we, we can make a really dark piece because your projection content is really specific, but is that doing what you want on the dancers mm -hmm. or are we just trying to problem solve against a projection idea, you know, and, and that, that, that becomes a bigger question for you as a choreographer. If you have this really cool projection idea, but we we're never going to see it or we're not going to see the dancers to be able to see it. Is that the right thing for your piece and mm -hmm. maybe it is but maybe it's not <laughs> so then say i have a longer period of time to work with a lighting designer like like you say we have six months before i know this piece is going to be on stage sure how much give and take 
do you feel like I, and obviously it depends on the collaborator but like how much how much is like the choreographer in your head that has like the final say versus the lighting design like how much do you push back in those conversations where in theory it should be more collaborative because you have more time to really flesh out the piece that you're trying to discover and create sure i mean at the end of the day the choreographer has the say you know i'm going to i'm going to try to give you the best um lighting design and i'm going to you know i will tell you if i think that something to me feels wrong uh or is not is not doing the thing that we're we're talking about trying to create but e yeah at the end of a three year process if the choreographer doesn't like it their name is on there as the like artistic head of this thing and i am the the lighting designer there are some lighting designers who will talk about lighting design as icing on the cake um mm -hmm. and i think it depends on the process of what you're doing um yeah it really depends because i think of like any orange grove dance piece that we've oh, yeah. done in the past couple years where the lighting is definitely not the icing on the cake. It is like fully integrated. It is like the eggs or however else you make the cake. Right. Like without it, right. it literally would not work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the absolutely. I fully agree with that. And also there are, there are definitely pieces that have, um, that can be done in the daylight at Jacob's pillow, you know, pieces that are still strong pieces that, uh, work like that and work under great lighting. But there are also pieces that probably don't. <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, some of our recent Orange Grove stuff is a, is a reasonable example of that where, you know, the the most recent piece we did, A&I, can't function without one, the lighting and two, the system that we designed to make that function. And trying to do that piece without that, I don't know if it's worth it. And you can talk to them about that <laughs> to see if they agree. But, you know, it's it's specifically that piece too is so about technology and where we are and our interaction with technology and if you take our interaction without tech with technology out of it i don't know what it's about mm -hmm. uh so yeah i mean it depends on on what you're creating so so i would say too like if you are creating a piece that uh you think technology or or lighting or projection or whatever is going to be a a big part of it or you want it to be that, then you should be talking to those lighting designers pretty early on. Those all those designers really early on, so that we can help you figure out how to integrate that into your piece. Because it's not, it's not a direct. It, it you can't just slide it in at the end, like you're saying, right? The, uh, if it's so integrated, so it it totally depends on the choreographer and the collaborator and the the. The piece that you're creating i've definitely done a lot of pieces where the piece is made and we're gonna walk into um a tech for three days and i'm going to lay something out on top of it and we don't have a whole lot of time to do it i mean <laughs> scale and everything changes right but uh three days we don't have a lot of time to really spend working on just the lighting we're not integrating into the piece in the same way but we're trying to create something that is representative of the piece and helps lift the piece which is what I'm always trying to do as a lighting designer anyway. Um, take what you're doing and help elevate it. Uh, and, oh, my thought just went away from me. <laughs> no worries. Um, well, and I was actually going to backtrack because uh, most people who are listening to this probably don't know Orange Grove Dance and all that stuff. So Orange sure. Grove Dance is a dance company that was founded by Matt Reeves and Colette Krogel, uh, originally in Florida, but they moved up to Maryland for their MFA program. And that's where we both met them first. I was an undergrad and started dancing with them and doing work with them. And then you came on as a lighting designer for different things. And then right. our roles have morphed throughout the years. I've, I've started to do more behind this like camera stuff with them. Cause they also do a lot of dance film. And you went from a lighting designer for stage stuff to building like a hundred. So like puck lights for an outside site specific piece and creating these very <laughs> elaborate things, um, which actually I do have a vlog on my YouTube channel from when we did the puck, the outside. Oh yeah. So if anyone's interested, um, go check it out. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, yeah. So Matt and Colette, I'm also hoping to get them on this at some point to talk through stuff. Cause like you said, A and I, I think it's such a timely piece where it's this really nice marriage of current technology, 
new technology and this uh how lighting and dance all that like interacts together it's really really unique because you built an ai i don't even know the right words that like model robot something uh, for it it we built an ai uh, right now it's kind of a voice assistant but it's an ai uh systems controller for the for the piece yeah yeah which is just crazy and i know you're already you're talking about the next version but like i know this is not quite what it is but for people listening, it was kind of like if I said, hey, Siri, turn on the lights. Hey, Siri, go to Q43 for me. And then like that's kind of how it helped the dancers like move throughout the piece, which was just really cool. And then there are ways right. that when Siri went not oh, it's not called Siri, like we call, you called it Luna. But when yep. it didn't hear the dancers correctly or things like that. So it really is another performer on stage, which is right. very, very unique. And that, and that's the, that's largely the point of it too is is that uh the dancers are interacting directly with this thing that is is controlling the world ultimately in the show we took two cues to make the show happen and the and luna made, took the rest of the cues and created these things created is a weird word for it but like is 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 helming this <laughs> this ship as we as we navigate through what the piece is um and the two cues ultimately are like bow look and the post show look because we never knew how long it would take the audience to clap at the end of the piece. <laughs> and I remember so it was like one of the first pieces I in a while that I wasn't part of the process at all. So I went to go watch it as an audience. And at the end, everyone's just sitting there in the dark because they weren't sure if it was over yet. And I think all of you were hoping that I would start clapping because I'd seen the dress rehearsal <laughs> and I just kind of sat there like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. so you guys started clapping and like behind the audience to get it right. going, and and then everybody joined in. Yeah, <laughs> but they I mean, just, people yeah, loved we, it. How how do you know when that piece specifically is over? Because there's a lot yeah. of there's a lot of darkness in it. There's a lot of moments that could be the end, and they're not. You know, or yeah, yeah, yeah. How is it as a lighting designer then trying to stay on top of new technology that is being developed? Whether it's I'm thinking of like going from you know, old school incandescent lights to now you have LED moving lights, like that kind of thing. Or an even bigger jump is like now integrating AI related technologies sure. into your work. Like how is that trying to stay on top of what is uh, like about to be like relevant while still being very, I mean, you are traveling all the time for current work. And then how do you get choreographers or directors to then understand what the new technology is so that you can integrate it or do you not need to like you just tell them this is going to happen and you're the one that you know takes care of the the back end most of the time it's that most of the time i i don't need a choreographer to be aware that i'm using a luster three uh led <laughs> unit that has a better deeper red chip and you know uh -huh. those things are are really useful to me and too much to burden choreographers with um so i think yeah keeping up with the technology of what i do is is always a battle to just kind of stay aware of what's going on um i try to keep myself immersed in lighting conversations and worlds and forums and you know all of those things so that even if i'm not necessarily participating all the time in those things I'll hear, oh, somebody's asking about what a great little moving profile light is. Oh, I can, eight people said that this is a great one. So I'm going to at least check that out. And if I can go to, you know, one of the, um, one of the rental houses and, and see it before I can use it, that's great. I will also say that a lot of the time, so dance tours into, uh, I worked with David Dorfman right now I'm lighting supervisor for a couple of his pieces and we tour into different venues across the country and the the reality right now is that I don't have to stay too up to date because most places are not revamping their inventory all the time you know um and when I when I get to a place that's going to have a new set of fixtures that I've never heard of I'm going to look them up and I'm going to figure out everything I can about them so that I, I have the most information walking into that building, but, um, you know, there are, there are still a lot of incandescents in the world. There are starting to be more and more LEDs, but they're not 
in most of the places that I'm touring dance right now, there are they are not super prevalent. The whole rig is not LED. Um, there are a handful of fixtures that are used all the time, and then some stuff outside of that that different companies use because it was cheaper or they could get a hold of it easier or it was new when they could get it and it was newer or different than some of the other things that are traditionally not traditionally uh but you know more prevalent in in the industry so um yeah i mean i i try to stay really up to date so that nobody else has to be uh but also i don't in the world of 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 that aspect of it I don't have to be the most on top of it person right now. <laughs> nice. The stuff, the stuff is interesting and it's interesting to see about and see what's coming. Like, like you said, to, to be able to, you know, know what, um, know what might be out in the next six months, because actually companies do reasonably often say, Hey, I, we want to buy new led fixtures in the next couple of years. Do you have recommendations? What do you use a lot? What do you like? Mm. And so I, having those answers is helpful to me and also then knowing their spaces and knowing what they work on is helpful to me because I would totally recommend wildly different fixtures if they're a, they're a, um, they only do dance or if they only do opera or theater, probably going to need different things and different numbers of things. So when you're designing a piece, do you ever try and keep in mind if this company were to try and tour this piece like I want to make it as easy as possible if that is a thing they want to do in the future. Minus Orange Grove. I feel like Orange Grove is just always, we you, we just make it really hard for ourselves. <laughs> but like for their average company, yeah. I mean, I we, di- we did have a lot of conversations during A&I about that too, just to, just to kind of stay aware of it. Because already with A&I specifically, we have a table and five chairs and four booms with TVs on them. You know, like there is a lot of stuff And the more that we own and can travel with versus stuff that we're going to ask somebody to go out and get, uh, the, at some point, the better, depending on a bunch of things like this one mattered because a lot of it was not stuff that people were going to have on hand. Um, and that we needed to be really specific about, but yeah, I, I do when we're working on a piece, I do keep that in the back of my mind all the time because I would rather be able to say okay really in what the piece that we've created is uh we we need this we need these five systems of light to make the piece work and if we can have seven systems of light that's awesome uh but we don't we're not always going to have that so what as we're creating it i'm staying aware of okay i've used these three lights i we put up a bunch to start but i haven't used these seven lights so maybe this eighth one only becomes a single you know, a a non-moving light because we only used it in one position, you know, and how can we mitigate that so that we're not making companies spend vast amounts of money to be able to put on the pieces that we're making. That said, some pieces need that, (laughs) you know, uh, I I've done some dance tours that we have, our writer comes out with, you know, these are the systems of light that we need. We need these two specific lights. So we need you to get those. And if you can't get those, tell us and we can figure out a a, a comparable thing that you can get a hold of or something that's still going to satisfy 95% of what we need out of it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I have that in the back of my head a lot. And I try to keep all my paperwork up to date, really, so it's easy to go, oh, in two weeks, we're actually going to go put this in at whatever venue I'm we're ready to do that. And it's not now a scramble to, to solve against equipment and against all of this. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that is such a valuable thing that not a lot of choreographers or collaborators think of, but the fact that you're thinking about that for them, I think it is another reason why you're such a valuable collaborator and all the things that you do. So I'm sure that's very appreciated. I, I think 90% of the time it's really appreciated. And every so often I catch myself going, oh, but that would be a whole other system of light to do this <laughs> thing. And it's a really cool thing and maybe we should do it. But my my gut instinct sort of goes, hold on. <laughs> Is this moment worth $3,000 mm. in every venue that we're going to ask to rent $3,000 worth of equipment? And sometimes the answer is definitely yes. And sometimes it's not. So I, I, I do try to keep that in check for myself too. <laughs> and I'm not always great at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the mark of a 
of an established designer or like someone who's been designing work for a while is that ability to question whether things are necessary or not. And sometimes it's even like, are I'm thinking more of projection design, like, are you even necessary to the process? I remember, I think I was talking to um, our mutual friend Kelly and there's a something quote like, you know, like sometimes maybe you don't need projection design for this piece. And so after talking, I'm going to say like, actually, I don't think you need me. You know, like there are right. times where you, maybe you need that or just being able to push back in a, in a constructive way to help guide the the idea. I feel like that is what sets a new designer apart from a more established designer. Um, or maybe just like you've done it well, so you're not as scared to be like, nope, we're not doing that. <laughs> First of all, when you start, I, you're like, okay, sure. Sounds good. I'll make it work. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're trained pretty early on to say yes to everything and then try to figure that out. Um, and a lot of times that's the right thing. And sometimes you have to, and it, it totally depends on your relationship with the choreographers um, and with the other collaborators in the room, you know, me nixing an idea for another department doesn't usually work mm -hmm. unless we're we've all been friends for nine years and we we're all comfortable doing that with each other and nobody's gonna get butthurt about it and i don't mean butthurt in a negative way just that like if if i come up with something and you're like no that's stupid and yeah. <laughs> we don't know each other i'm probably not gonna be very receptive to that <laughs> <laughs> right so then actually can we, let's go back and can you talk a little bit about how you even got into lighting design because i know you also have a background in theater yep. and you have just so many other like random skills that people who just meet you would not <laughs> expect spoiler sure. alert he rides unicycles um but yeah can you give a, a brief overview of how you ended up where you are today yeah uh i'll try to make it brief so i started as an actor in undergrad in high school and blah 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 i went to undergrad as an actor in theater musical theater um, I, you know, we, we took some classes, you know, to take like intro to lighting and intro to sound and stage management because I desperately avoided scenic and costumes because I don't draw. Uh, and <laughs> so I took those and, and lighting was the most interesting and I started digging into it a little bit more, but it was complicated in undergrad. You kind of had to pick one focus and, and having two focuses was com complicated and hard. So Where'd I you mostly go for stayed undergrad. Thank you. Uh, that was a good prompt. I went to UC Irvine in Southern California. I grew up in Northern California. Um, so when I graduated from undergrad, I was working at my theater company back home in my little tiny hometown in Northern California. And they, their lighting designer turned out was leaving and they offered it to me. And I kind of went, I took two and a half classes in undergrad in lighting <laughs> and I are you sure? And they went, yeah, we know you, we, we know you'll figure it out. So, uh, I did, I was their resident lighting designer for three years. We did theater. So plays and, and, and musicals. And, um, I spent a lot of time in like the middle of the night going, well, what if I put the light over here? What does that do for this? Oh, what if I try this? So I'm, I don't like saying I, I'm not really self-taught, but I am, I, I did do a lot of self-teaching to understand what I, what I like and what I'm interested in. Yeah. And sorry, sorry to interject real quick, but I feel that's a perfect, perfect example of how it is so much more important to know people and to be liked by people and just be willing to like learn than to be a skilled designer or at whatever it is, choreographer, performer. Because the fact sure. that they just knew you, that's how you got the job. It's not because you already had the skills. And that's definitely happened to me multiple times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, they know that you're willing to figure it out and put time in to figure it out. Yeah. And they trust Even you. if it's not something that you're already ready just to drop and do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. No, you're fine. Uh, so I, I did that for three years. And I was the only person in the lighting department at this theater company. So I was teaching myself and mostly on my own with you know directors who know what they want out of lights sometimes or um all of that i had i had good mentors but not people who were focused on lights most of the time so i decided after my third year to go to grad school i went to grad school at the university of maryland um which is the first time i lit any dance uh that's a lie it's the first time i really lit any dance <laughs> I <had laughs> one thing in undergrad that was like festival style in one day and I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but 
I started lighting dance and opera in addition to theater in, in grad school. And I like, I met Matt and Colette and I met you. Um, and we, and then they started hiring me outside of, outside of school. And we built this relationship. So I started doing more and more dance and I'm doing, I don't know, maybe I'm doing 50% dance right now. 50% wow. That's dance. a lot. Considering you went from zero before you got to grad school. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it might be 40 to 50 and it changes every, every couple months, but I do a fair amount of dance. Um, these days I mostly do theater, musicals, opera, dance. I do a little bit of live music. I'd like to do a little bit more live music, but it's that like segment of the industry is separate from the theater, dance, opera world. So breaking into that's a little bit harder. Um, and I, I, so I, I do mostly lighting design, a fair amount of it for dance. I, I'm the lighting supervisor for David Dorfman's shows, uh, right now. I do a little bit of other lighting supervision and then, uh, I don't know if you want to go into this yet, but I've, I build other things for <laughs> other people who need stuff. Um, <laughs> like what? That's so big. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like what do you build? <laughs> Cause it's a lot of different things. Um, Oh, good example of <laughs> just why my brain does this. Somebody contacted me, uh, who I work with elsewhere. And he was like, Hey, I have a question from a friend. I seem to remember you talking about working on this, this thing where, um, people in the audience could vote or answer questions or whatever on their phones. And that could like go back into the system. I and mean, I've never done that. I built a thing where there are buttons at every seat and they can choose A or B for the show and that can push it for a choose your adventure kind of show um, and built the whole system for that. And I've done, I'm working on this captioning project with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Tim Kelly, where um, theaters can for free use this program where they just have to have somebody pressing spacebar advancing through these captions and they'll show up on everybody's phones who's connected to the system. Whoa, and so you cool. can have live captioning. Yeah, it's it's great. It, I mean, to give an option for people to experience live theater in that way without for, for companies who can't afford or whatever, can't bring on an interpreter or things like that, we can have that the that option. Um, so that is like communication and conversation with phones and a system. But he said that and I went, no, I haven't. It's interesting. I haven't done it. So now I have a working prototype and this is, I uh, had that working in 24 hours. <laughs> wow. And he wasn't really asking for me to do it. He just asked if I had done it. So now there's a thing uh, that, you know, is not polished and it's, it's largely functional. There's still some stuff I would need to fix if I ever wanted to release it. Um, but so stuff like that or stuff like building those 175, 200, wireless lights to control in a field from the same lighting console that we use typically in theater and dance or uh i mean a lot of that started with children of babel the orange grove dance we show we did right before the pandemic where we built in some wireless lights into uh uh boards two by fours in the show um and have gone on to do more <laughs> where where do you think so I feel like when I think of you as an artist, there's a sense of like tinkering and not being afraid to just try a crazy idea and you'll work it and make a prototype and just make it better. Where do you think that sense of just being willing to try stuff and figure it out as you go came from? Because I feel like not all designers are like that. Some are very much a, this is what I do. This is what I know. And we're going to do it this way or I'm not the right designer for you. Versus yeah. you, I feel like are much more willing to fit into the idea that someone is trying to create, even if it's not quite in your current skill set. Yeah, I, I've always been a tinkerer. I, I had to do a science project when I was in like seventh grade where we tried to build a generator bicycle so that you had to be pedaling to watch the TV, oh, which cool. was a cool concept. It didn't, we never made it work, oh. but we tried for a long time. Uh, and in seventh grade, I just didn't know what I was doing. I still don't most of the time know what I'm doing, but I'm, you know, going to keep trying. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I've always been really interested in both the design aspect and the technical aspect of what I do. Um, I program a lot of my own shows too, 
Oh, and, and I, I do some side work programming for other people. Um, and I, and the technology has always been interesting to me and not something that I just have to understand to be able to do my job. And there are a lot of designers who are very much artists first, who, who don't need to know anything about the technical things that are going on. You know, most of the people working, that's not true. A lot of the people working on Broadway are, they're not allowed to touch a console. They're not allowed to touch lights. They're, they're not allowed to touch anything because of union rules. So they don't need to know syntactically how the console is going to mm. understand and interpret what you're saying. They don't need to know as specifically how this moving light is going to get from point A to point B because someone else is going to take care of that for them. And like that is a specific set of designers, but there are, that mindset is in a lot of places. Um, which I think is totally fine. Just to be clear, I, I think that that is a totally reasonable way to do what we do and, and keeps you from overworking yourself sometimes and keeps you from like having to learn new skills to be able to do the same amount of work that other people are doing. <laughs> um, I'm interested in that stuff, so it doesn't bother me very much most of the time. Uh, and I, it's fun to do for me. So I don't, I, I don't feel like I'm being put out doing that. Um, but it does really depend on the person <laughs> you're working with because, and then just to, just to have this conversation briefly, like it also me doing this makes it so that muddies the waters between a lighting designer and a technician. And so then people that I work with might try to work with someone else. And when they're not going to do stuff, that's not their job. Mm it complicates that relationship. Um, so I have questions about how much I do it sometimes just, just for the sake of our industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested in doing it. So I I've been doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that also makes me think of whenever I've done, you know, film projects for people, whether it's a choreographer or a studio, you know, technically I'm doing all the jobs. I'm the DP, I'm the gaffer, I'm the electrician, like, because I'm setting up lights sometimes or I'm, you know, so, you know, but when it's a smaller budget project, you know, and those people don't know that what I'm doing is technically, you know, five jobs or whatever it is. I, right. I imagine it's similar with you where if they go to you because they know you're the lighting person, they don't really understand that, well, normally this is a couple different jobs if it's right. really going to be done the, the correct quote unquote way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, I mean, it's sorry, go ahead. It's, it's complicated. It's, it's a, it's a weird thing because you know, when, when I do that work for, for companies and I'm kind of doing everything, am I setting other people back? Because then this designer won't want to work with other people who won't, do the same amount of work that I'm doing because they are. And I think a lot of the time they're right. <laughs> you know, when, when there is money to do it and when there is a, a structure of reasons to do things this way, like the union, right? There are the, the design union. There are certainly rules in some places that I think push a little too far. Like ask, asking, I don't have a great example right now, but like, they it becomes overreach doesn't feel like the right word here but you know there are there are some rules where you you can't do some specific things as as someone who's not a part of the union mm -hmm. and i some of them feel like they go a little too far and some of them are a, a lot of them are actually protecting and there's a really good reason for it even if you don't work in a venue like that all the time so you don't see the reason that that union rule exists there's a reason that that union rule exists and the reason that we kind of do things that way and i'm not saying that we should never question how things are done because i do that all the time right but but i think that when you're working in someone else's house <laughs> you have to kind of trust that the rules are there for a good reason and and have a conversation about it instead of fighting it and I mm. see that sometimes that kind of exhausts me watching, <laughs> watching these people come in and just be so angry about this thing, but they don't understand why. And yeah. there is a reason why. And like, it's, it's, it's all complicated. 
which all comes from if I am training people to think that my job is to program the show and hang all the lights and create all of these things, then when they go to a venue where that's absolutely not the case, who am I setting them up for, for failure? Am I setting up other lighting designers to be failures because they don't care enough about the art to do five different jobs to make it happen? Mm -hmm. It's complicated. <laughs> yeah. No good answers to that one. Mm -hmm. um, side tangent. If you see that Martian up there, that is the one and only union job I've ever performed in. It was <laughs> how to catch a star at the Kennedy center. And Peter was the lighting designer for that show. Yep. So afterwards they let me, I think, buy the Martian for like $5. <laughs> It was great. I love that. I, I saw that up there and I was trying to, I, I thought that's what it was. But yeah. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I know we don't have too much more time left because you have to be somewhere in a little bit. So I had two other questions I wanted to at least briefly touch on. Yeah. Uh, so besides being an incredible designer and tinker and all those things, you are a really good educator as well at least from what I've seen at the Orange Grove Dance Intensives, you've taught lighting workshops and things like that. And you have a really helpful way of breaking down light and the different qualities of light. So I was wondering if you could do a brief run through of those qualities and some examples. So if someone's thinking about how am I going to light this piece or how am I going to talk to someone about lighting this piece, whether it's for a live performance or even for a film, like they have just some better vocabulary to use so can you do a sure. quick run through of those qualities yeah so uh properties of light uh this concept and how that's how it's laid out is from richard pilbro who's a uk light designer who passed last year maybe um so four properties of light you have intensity which we all understand brightness darkness somewhere in between you know and, and usually lighting we refer to it as percentage if it's at zero percent it's off a hundred percent it's all the way on as bright as that light can be um, something I always talk about when I'm, when I am teaching these things is, is the relativity of every aspect of this. So our eyes are adjusting and you know, this a lot because of film that, you know, you're, you're doing a, a white balance correction. You're doing all of those things. Our eyes are doing that too. So if we sit in a blue light for long enough, it'll start to feel a lot closer to white, less saturate than the blue that we started out with. And then you can play with that and you can use that, but that is something that you have to consider all the time in lighting. So relative brightness, right? I can turn on one light at full that's going to be a lot dimmer than another light at 50. But understanding of, of intensity, right? Uh, and then you have color. So color is something that most people understand, even colorblind people like me, uh, where, <laughs> you know, there there are, you have, if you look at a color wheel, there's hue and saturation, how far you are from white is saturation, where you are in the circle is hue. Um there's 16 million options in most LEDs of those things. They're very subtle, obviously, because how do you have 16 million options? Um, but you can get any any point on that circle. Um, colors relative, again. Uh, uh -huh. light, color in light is different than color in pigment, which I, I think is important to just say really quick. So uh, in light, you're largely dealing with, dealing with like RGB, in a lot of LEDs, CMY sometimes, cyan, magenta, yellow. Um, if you mix all of those together in, in light, you get white. If you mix all of those things together in pigment, you get black, dark gray, brown, right? Um, so there's a concept of additive and subtractive mixing, which matters a lot in, in lighting. And I'll let you look that up on your own. It's fun. Uh, LEDs are additive. Gels uh, are subtractive mixing. Oh, didn't know that. Because you're cool. taking in like gel, you're taking a white light and filtering out some things. You're subtracting uh, color and you're just getting one color. Oh. LEDs, most of the time, some people make a white LED and then put filters in front of it. To, so then that's technically subtractive mixing. But uh, LEDs, if you turn on all the blue LEDs, you have blue. If you turn on then all the red LEDs, you're getting a magenta that is mixing and adding these two things together to make the white. Oh, cool. So now you don't have to look it up on your own, but it's a really cool <laughs> <laughs> concept. Um, uh, so intensity, color, form. Form is a really big one, so it's it's a broad category. I always think of it as my brain first does angle. So where the light is coming at you as the performer, 
compared to the audience. So if it's coming from over the audience to you, then it's a front light. If it's coming from behind you, pointing in the direction of the audience, but still hitting you, it's a backlight. Uh, and you have front light, angled front light, side light, low side light, low front light, diagonal backlight, low diagonal backlight, up light, silhouette light. You know, there's a lot of different angles of light in how it uh, interacts with the person on stage. But they're all they're all pretty straightforward. Where is it coming from? If you're standing on stage looking at the audience, where are you pointing at it? That's that's the type of angle it is. And they all do different things. Um, Film like backlight, you talk about hair light or got something else too. Uh, rim light, edge light, I think. Sometimes. Rim light. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're all the same concepts across uh, theater and film, but different terms sometimes. Uh, so that's angle, right? And then you have uh, other parts of form are like how sharp is the edge of the beam? Are you making a really clear delineation between lightness and darkness in a circle? Or are you letting that fade off as it as it dissipates? You could start and center really bright and then slowly become darkness as you walk as you walk away um can also be things like uh texture so if you've heard of a gobo uh i have ooh, have a bunch uh gobo so this is a thin piece of metal that you put in specific kinds of light and it can cast this as a type of light coming out of it so anything that's cut through here would be the light part and the rest of it would be dark so it can it can help create texture in a piece it can help make you feel like you're under uh leaves in the sunlight right um it can it can also help make a window you know th there are hundreds of gobos um that you can use uh great and then the last one as i as i explain it is movement or time so uh talking about the all those other properties with time applied so you can have a light that's you can be sitting in darkness and then snap up to full and that's one change and that's a version of time zero <laughs> and then i've done cues that fade up over 45 minutes um or fade out over five minutes in the end of the piece and you're not ever sure when it's done because you're watching for something to stop and then it's finally actually in darkness um uh but any of those properties apply. You can you can change the form of the light. You can change the angle of the light over time. And one thing that I think is important to acknowledge here is that anytime you turn on any light, you're making a ch you're making all the choices about all four of those properties. If you turn on the light in your bedroom, you're turning it on to full. You're turning it on in whatever color it is. But you've maybe you've chosen, maybe someone else has chosen. It's a warm light, warm white, or a cold white, or whatever. You're, it's probably a soft light in your room. It's not casting sharp shadows of your body or the other things in your room. Um, but and and you've turned it on to zero count. But every time you turn on any light, your those properties are actively being chosen, which I think is important to think about. Just because we we don't think about that as just people walking around our daily lives. Yeah, I do because I I walk around and go, oh, the sunlight's cutting through these trees and it's casting these soft shadows and of the leaves and it's in this kind of rich amber because it's so low in the sky and it's creating this low side light because it's low in the sky. Um, I love that. I love thinking about that stuff. Um, and I would encourage all of your listeners <laughs> to try to next time you see some light, constantly think about those things and see see how that's affecting you. Um, we also talk about in lighting. Richard Pilbrough again you have the aims in the properties so there's aims of of lighting design too which is how you use those properties to reveal form in specific ways how do you draw the eye to look at what you're looking at I always think of a lighting designer as a cinematographer of theater mm -hmm. I'm telling you what to look at what's important and how to feel about it <laughs> yeah other people are doing that too but I you know that's one of my big jobs um yeah that's the properties yeah, that was so funny. I remember when now I do the same thing now walking around after I learned lighting more for cinematography, but now I'll I'll look in a room and oh, the light's coming from there. It's bouncing off there. It's warm. It's cool. It's you know right. doing all these things. Um yeah, same thing. Um yeah, I mean I think that was just super helpful, especially thinking about the time component. I think that's something that I think brightness and color, like intensity, color come very naturally to people. Yeah. but they don't often think about the time it takes to get to that point, which is right. super, super helpful. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I think is interesting about time is that like, 
I always, I always talk about this when I'm teaching is that, you know, we are, our eyes are adjusting. I know I said this, but like, if you turn on a light at full and you want it to feel like it's going to be bright for the next 10 minutes, that might not work. You might have to turn it on to 80% and then fade it over mm-hmm. five minutes to full so that our eyes are still feeling like it's intense mm-hmm. because otherwise your eyes adjust and it might, you, you might like mentally know that it's bright and it might be bright in the room, but we're not, if you're trying to be like accosting with the light, you're not going to feel that as much over five minutes. So finding the ways to keep that feeling happening or let it fade away or over the next five minutes, fade that light even further down. So it doesn't, so it feels more welcoming or whatever you're trying to create, mm-hmm. right? Like time doesn't have to be between zero and 10 seconds. Yeah, Time can be, and I've done pieces where, you know, we start a queue that's a 10 minute long queue. And then there are a bunch of other queues running beneath that, but there's something that is getting brighter and brighter, and brighter over the top of that for the whole time, which can be really exciting. And a, a good, you know, it doesn't have to be this look, then this look, then this look, it can be these things moving through each other as we go. Yeah. That's definitely a big difference between live performance and film where right. the camera doesn't have that same, some would say issue, but some, I don't know, sometimes I feel like it's, harder because you might think it looks good to your eye and you look into the camera and you're like oh that's way too dark or that doesn't look right. good, correct so you have to it's a very different way of lighting for film versus live performance but those Absolutely. same properties still apply no matter what it's just the camera's stupid so it's not as good as our eyeballs <laughs> our eyes are more advanced <laughs> than the camera <laughs> yeah yeah um i had said i had two more but then i thought of another so now i have two more questions for you sure great um <laughs> uh so looking back, you've done a lot of stuff. Also, in case you missed it, Peter is colorblind. So as a lighting designer, I just always think that's fascinating. I always bring it up when we're talking and <laughs> with people who don't know you. Um, but I'm mildly red green colorblind. I don't want anybody to think that I see in grayscale. <laughs> uh. <laughs> no color at all. <laughs> um, but think thinking back to all of the different experiences you've had for lighting design even some projection design like you said you've done theater work you've done a lot of different stuff what is something that you would tell your younger designer self that would have really helped you in your journey if you actually listened to that advice ah it's a great question and it can be my, as specific or as broad as you want to take it i think my my immediate response, and I don't know how much I agree with that, but my immediate response is like, make choices and go with them. Mm. Um, and like, a career or design, I think is kind of both, but like, it's easier. We we talked about this when I was in acting school all the time, where it's easier to get someone to, who has a big choice to be able to uh, adjust that and, and make it into something really great than to get to make someone push someone to make a bigger choice so that then we can resolve it because then you're always going to be kind of pushing them up forward rather than just uh uh, massaging this thing into the right place um so big choices are really exciting and i it's not that i don't make big choices or i didn't make big choices when i was younger but embracing that and being willing to do that all the time and you can't always, you know, if I'm in a process where we have 10 minutes to do something and we just need to see the people, I'm going to turn on some lights to see the people. I'm not going to be like, what if the whole thing was in silhouette? Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, the, there are a lot of chances to make big choices. And again, that's easier to find the right choice once you've made a choice. And if mm-hmm. you don't make choices and you just kind of go, I don't know, maybe like a warm white side light and front light and backlight now they just look like they're there but you're uh-huh. not making some like big artistic statement and and that is worth it a lot of the time and some and and you don't have to worry that somebody's gonna be like oh yeah that's a great idea what is he doing uh you know <laughs> somebody will be like that's that's a choice i don't love it that's that's really green why is that so green maybe it couldn't be that green mm-hmm. but you know it's it's again it's easier for someone to make to help you resolve your choice than to push you to make a choice. Love it. Beautiful. Cool. (laughs) Um, Oh, before I ask you my last question, just, I thought you would appreciate this. So when we moved in, 
this whole wall, the black part, that's all sound foam that the previous owner had put in because this was like a gaming room. So it's okay. really cool. Yeah, but yeah. my black shelf with the LED lights, when I put it up, the black foam just like absorbed all the yeah. light. Right. And so I had to move my shelf, take down the foam that just was in that box uh -huh. and I put up white paper. So that's white why paper, I, yeah. that's what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can get reflection out of it. Yeah, exactly. Of, I mean, I talk about this when I'm teaching too. Without anything to light, light doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can point light out into nothing and it's not going to affect anything. But, you know, having something to reflect off of or bounce off of, whether that's people or customs or set, you know, like you have to have that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think this one really actually taught me that material makes a big difference because yeah. there was a wood, a black wooden beam in the middle where the guy had mounted a TV. Yeah. And on the wood, even though it was still black, you could see the lights better. But then right. on everything where that was foam, it was just like you could not see the lights at all. So do you know yeah. why that is? I think it's interesting. So the foam, any light that gets in there is going to bounce around inside all of the foam holes before oh. it comes back to you. So it's getting absorbed and bounced around and blocked by other parts of the foam holes, whereas wood is a much more much less porous thing. Right. So you're going to see more of more reflection off of any sheen in the grain and you're going to see more just straight reflection off rather than it getting like caught up inside. Oh, cool. I guess that's why foam works well with muffling sounds too, because the sound gets absorbed yeah. and just bounces around. Right, because light's a wave too. So we're just like, we're doing the same thing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sound yeah. and, and light wise. And just one other thing, because I think it's interesting. You can cut it if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, material in costume and fabric is going to make a huge difference in lighting as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and like the 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 easy way to explain it is if you're wearing red and I throw green light at you, it's going to kill most of the red. And it's going to feel like brown or black because there's no green light to bounce off of. Uh, there's no red light that's hitting the red fa fabric and coming back at you because the green light is not red and it's getting absorbed, which is, you know, how lighting objects works in color, mm -hmm. right? Um and then there's there's a lot of materials that will have a lot of different color in them. And sometimes that's a really great thing for a lighting designer because then you can like shift what you're seeing in the costume. But that also means that I try to make sure I have a conversation with the costume designer <laughs> at the end of every day and be like, did that costume actually look like what you were trying to get out of it? Uh -huh. Or if I push a little blue into it, I might be able to get more X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, but material, man, it's <laughs> it shifts everything that we see and understand. Yeah, I'm even thinking of at the um, Orange Grove Intensive, uh, th the week before the intensive, the company was there filming stuff for a new project. Right. And Matt was telling me how one of the costumes material was like a really like silk or something that had a very high sheen. Yeah. And so then when they took it outside into the sun, it was a cloudy day, like foggy, but it was still so reflective that it created all these hot spots in the camera, like the yeah. footage. And he could not figure out how to get rid of it. It's like, it's crazy how much differently, like how different fabrics react is. Yeah. It's yeah. so interesting. If you, if you can get fabrics under light in, and especially if you're doing film stuff in, in behind, behind a camera, that will make all the difference in, in your understanding of how that's going to be dealt with testing that stuff. Even if it's running into like a theater on a day off and being like, this is blue light. What does this do? Okay, great. Now at least I know so we're on the same page and here are five fabrics that I want to look the same. If we can test that, that's always going to be helpful. Mm. Okay, last question before we go. What is your biggest pet peeve when it comes to working with dancers? Specifically as a lighting designer. Oh, not just as... Okay. Uh... <laughs> Uh, wow, I don't have an immediate response, which I guess is a good thing that it doesn't oh, like, yeah. stare at me all the time. Um, so the short answer is Peter loves working with answers and you should hire him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that was the right way to spin that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, then are there any pet peeves in general when you when you're working on projects where 
if someone does something this way, it just rubs you the wrong way? It depends on the person and the project. Sometimes when people are trying to use lighting terms really heavily, when they think they know what we're talking about and they only sort of know what they're talking about, it, it makes it more complicated because I'm going, do you mean diffusion? Because you're not saying diffusion, you're saying run the edge. And that's not art. What are you, what are you trying to get at here? Like, let's just talk about the, it's easier most of the time if we have time to talk about the idea than it is about the like specific thing. And I know that contradicts what I said about like festival work, where if you want it blue, tell me it's blue. But like, if, if this moment doesn't feel right, talk to me about what that feeling is, because I've done this for a long time. I have probably encountered a feeling like that before and I can help solve that instead of you saying, well, it feels like it's too whatever in, in a technical term that we can try that. But if you don't have that experience and really like really know your stuff, if you haven't been a lighting designer for more than 10 years, <laughs> I it, it's going to be a hard balance to like figure that out. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's a great tip for anyone, whether you're working with a designer or videographer or whatever, making sure you're using the same terms in the same way yeah. is super yeah. important. Don't assume the other person knows what you're talking about because yeah, I might go to you and I think I know lighting, but even between my photography lighting and your stage lighting, I'm sure we use the same terms a little bit differently. So right. we should always yeah. make sure that you're using, you're talking about the same thing. It does happen a lot in in weird little specific ways striking a light for you is a different thing than striking a light for me <laughs> yeah uh and i i i i try to treat it as some of my job when i'm working with new people to figure out some of that vocabulary and sometimes that means that i'm going to speak to you about lighting design different than i'm going to speak to like matt and colette because mm -hmm. we have a shared vocabulary understanding of when you say i want it to be this I can help you get there, but that's not how I would say it to Matt and Clyde because they use those terms differently. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't, I don't need you to know the really technical terms and I don't need you to know the really specific definitions of those. I just need us to be able to like speak on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. This popped into my head and it's only mildly related. So bear with me. <laughs> okay. uh, the, I, I was playing a game with a group of people like 10 years ago. Uh, and it was like, it wasn't taboo, but it was something like taboo where you're trying to get somebody to say something and they didn't know mm -hmm. you can't, you can't use specific words. Um, and it was a movie and they went Tom Hanks, San Francisco guys, Tom Hanks, San Francisco, come on, San Francisco, Tom Hanks, like, and they kept, they doubled down on this so hard <laughs> for the full minute that you gave us no new information. There's no, does anybody get it? No. So why are you continuing to say it? Like we're not, we're not communicating properly. You, if, if we didn't get it right the second time, we got to change tactics. And this is something that we that is taught, taught a lot in like acting. Right. But, uh, if you're not getting the desired result, <laughs> continually repeating the thing that you're, you're trying to get is not going to solve it. And that mm, yeah. happens a lot actually. Where people are like, ah, it's too blue. They don't really mean too blue, but like that's what they mean in their head, and that's fine. And then I I make an adjustment. They go, no, it's too blue. And if 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 after the second time we've done that, I haven't made the correct adjustment, we need to figure out a better way to talk about what we're talking about. Yeah, because I clearly I'm not getting at I'm not getting the thing that you're trying to get from me. So. And I, I'm never trying to be obstinate. I'm never trying to be like, no, you mean, <laughs> but you know, so we just, we just have to like, keep figuring out how to talk to each other and, and understand that we're all coming at it from different worlds and different everything. Maybe this is a pet peeve. <laughs> oh, okay. There we Maybe go. That's so where got I came it. from it. Like, let's, <laughs> we, we have to be open to communication and figuring out how to communicate with each other specifically in, in every day in different ways because it's just it's not worth us getting frustrated with each other about w things that we're not understanding from each other mm -hmm. yeah makes sense <laughs> uh cool well on that note i feel like we need to wrap it up because you need to get going soon um oh, but yeah. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to chat. This is super fun. Absolutely. Uh, are there places people can follow you or keep up with your work or you'd like to point people to? Because, you know, after this conversation, all the dancers are going to be reaching out to you to Perfect. light their work. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, my Instagram is my initials. Good luck. P-F-A-L-V-I. So maybe you can throw I'll put that on screen. in the yeah, description. Yeah. Great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, my website is my name, peterlibel.com. Um, there's good examples of my work there. Um, and I will say, this, this always feels like weird self-promotion, but I don't totally mean it as self-promotion. If, if you choreographers out there are looking for uh, someone to light your work or you're working on a piece, call one of us. And you you might be like, I only have a hundred dollars to give somebody. I only have fifteen dollars. I can buy someone a Coke. But like talk to us because sometimes that's the right thing for us. And if I have a free day and and can give you some advice to help you figure out a thing, and then maybe in the future we get to actually work on a, a full scale project, that's great. Uh and not everybody's gonna say yes to a Coke, but like, you know, it's it's worth having that conversation with us and don't assume that because you're young and and don't have a big breadth of work yet and can't offer a whole lot of money or whatever. Don't think that that means you shouldn't reach out to a lighting designer and try to see what you, you all can do together. I see that happen a lot and it's not worth it. Just call us <laughs> messages. Yeah. So I, okay. Also, I realized we didn't talk about your, your unicycles at all. So oh, yeah. we'll have to have another follow-up conversation <laughs> because that is literally always one of the highlights of the orange grove dance intensive when we do our, um, I forget what they, we call it, like we make shifts. Make shift, yeah. And you always end the night with your unicycle and everyone's like, what is this? <laughs> so it, so if you come to the intensive next year, people, oh, there we go. We got a plug. that I've ridden the unicycle. Yeah. Because it's a fun surprise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Orange Grove Dance, I think, dot com. I think it's usually in July for a week. So yep. check it out. Um, but again, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, everyone, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow the channel, all that stuff. I'll have all of Peter's things in the description as well. And see you next time. <laughs>